Death Stranding is a game that came out two years ago. Time. Why Why you do this? Why you gotta be this way? Came out back in November of 2019, and almost two years later since its launch, we're gonna get what's called the Director's Cut, and I've been playing the review copy provided by PlayStation over the last week and a half. Played about 55 to 60 hours of it, and while you can load your PlayStation 4 save file and just pick up from Endgame and just see all the new content straight away, I decided to just start the game from the very beginning, played all the way through, so I could get an idea for how the new features are introduced, how it affects the experience, how it affects the flow and progression of the game. Now, right out of the gate, if you're someone who tried Death Stranding and it just wasn't for you, the director's cut isn't gonna change your mind. This is essentially, at its core, the same game, but newcomers who have been curious to try out the game or veterans itching to dive back in, this is, without question, the definitive version of the game, as there are some neat additions that do make for an overall better experience, and I'll get into the details in a bit. But for those who want a basic summary of what Death Stranding is, if you just want the short synopsis, you basically play a delivery man in a post-apocalyptic America that's seen its infrastructure crumble and connections severed following the Death Stranding cataclysm that has caused the world of the living and the dead to bleed into each other, resulting in all kinds of detrimental supernatural phenomena that the world must now cope with. And delivery men are a core part of this world as the world is now disconnected because of the infrastructure breakdown and you, a Sam Porter Bridges, carry important packages around that isolated people need. And the whole idea behind this game is you have to rebuild the open world infrastructure so these deliveries become easier. You will start out with just your own two feet, and that initial phase of tedious struggle is what can turn a lot of people off from this game. But as the game progresses, as you complete more deliveries and bring more regions of America into the network on your journey from east to west, you'll unlock vehicles, gear, equipment, tools, weapons, crafting materials, placeable structures, and you'll also rebuild major roads that will make navigating the world faster and overcoming challenges, threats, obstacles, hazards, and nature itself easier. But you're not rebuilding the infrastructure of the world alone. It's not a task you do by yourself. You're doing it with other players in this shared world light type of environment. While each player's instance is separate, contributions do bleed into other player sessions. Kind of like Dark Souls messages, except populating Death Stranding are other players' vehicles, gear, equipment, tools, weapons, placeable structures, crafting material donations, you name it. And the whole idea is to combine and link your own contributions with those of other players to rebuild and reconnect the world, reinforcing Death Stranding's core theme of connections. The idea that things are easier if we just come together, if we show kindness towards each other if we strive to lend a helping hand it's a very positive message and you really feel that sense of gratitude throughout the game when another player's structure happens to come clutch be it a bridge that happens to be well placed to shorten your delivery route a zip line that happens to be conveniently situated that allows you to link your own or a safe house that offers respite while you're running on fumes and it also feels good to see the positive impact your own structures may have had on other players, as shown by the likes accrued by your structure, given by other players, and it also feels good to return that sentiment by giving your own likes. You can decide to play the game entirely offline, but you'll just have a significantly harder time, which is the whole point and message that the game's trying to convey. Now, there is action in Death Stranding, but it's not its main focus. I prefer to think of Death Stranding as being more akin to something like Factorio, maybe, if it had light communal shared world elements. They're both games that revolve around building an efficient system and infrastructure towards a common long-term goal. They're not exactly alike, but I feel they're kind of similar in that way. But Death Stranding sets itself apart in that you do it with online strangers who you really never meet in person. They're kind of like ghosts who help you out. Death Stranding is also more structured, does have this main storyline campaign that's pretty epic, high quality cutscenes, makings of a AAA game, but generally, to me, this feels more like a communal builder experience with action elements on the side, rather than a game that focuses on third-person action gameplay. Now, I do get why this game might not be for everyone. It is 
a lot of just navigation. There are aspects of it that can feel clumsy, where mobility and climbing is concerned at times. Not all aspects of its user interface and navigating menus is the most intuitive it could be, and it's certainly not perfect, but for my part, I still freaking love this game, and I actually had an even better time this time around because I actually knew what I was doing. I focused more on rebuilding roads, setting up the groundwork for future deliveries just to make everything work more efficiently and the like, and I found it just immensely satisfying feeling deliveries become much more efficient with the help of other players, seeing how much progress has been made from the slog of that beginning portion of the game where you're just walking around on your two legs with very little support. Now, the director's cut does carry over pros and cons of the original, but there are certainly significant enhancements and additions that do make it a noticeably better game overall. Graphically, the game already looked gorgeous on PlayStation 4, but on PlayStation 5, you get the benefit of high resolution, frame rate, and just better graphic settings. To this day, I feel Death Stranding remains one of the most visually stunning looking games. The vistas can be breathtaking, the photorealistic models and textures have incredible fidelity to them, especially during cutscenes. The art style and aesthetic of everything is compelling, and the game looks and runs even better on PlayStation 5. And faster loading times does mean that fast travel is significantly faster. Then there's haptic feedback, which is well implemented with in-game textures and vibrations being represented through the controller, and adaptive triggers get harder to squeeze the more burdened Sam is by the weight of his cargo. The director's cut also bundles in all the past additional content that's been implemented in the game, like the Valve and Cyberpunk stuff, which finally brings us to the director's cut specific content. The way I'll present this stuff is by going through them in the order of appearance, starting with additions to the early game up to episode 2, when you're still in the eastern region. People usually tell you that the best way to experience Death Stranding is to beeline your way to episode 3 to the central region, which is when things actually start to pick up and open up, and then start doing side quests and play the game normally. Many will agree that the first two episodes do feel like one giant overly drawn out tutorial where I spent 10 hours in my first playthrough and about 7 hours this time, and I think how drawn out this initial section of the game can be is a detriment and can turn people off early. It is an important introductory segment, mind you, it's just it could have been paced better and offered more useful tools more steadily. Now, the director's cut comes in and helps mitigate that in a number of ways. The game's first big long distance delivery to the incinerator, for example, will now offer a few recommended routes to help ease players into this delivery task that will be commonplace throughout the whole experience. It is just for this one delivery, though, but it will help guide newcomers in this initial leg of their journey, and it will help acclimate them towards the practice of routing out their deliveries, looking at the map and the topography. More significant is the introduction of new early game tools. About four and a half hours in after the completion of order number nine, I was given a mission involving an abandoned factory, this new interior area exclusive to the director's cut, and completing this mission thread yielded the Mazer gun and the support exoskeleton, completely new to the director's cut. The Mazer Gun is a non-lethal weapon that electrifies enemies as long as your reticle is trained on the target. It does definitely feel like the weakest of the non-lethal weapons in this game, but it is an introductory weapon and it's good to have during that introductory leg. And then the support exoskeleton increases your weight capacity to make it easier to navigate with weightier cargo so Sam feels better to control when he is carrying a lot with him. But this specific skeleton doesn't excel at any one thing, whereas exoskeletons unlocked later grant you significant boosts in strength, speed, or terrain traversal. This is more of a jack-of-all-trades but a master-of-none exoskeleton, and both of these new additions were specifically implemented to make the first two episodes in that introductory East Coast region less tedious, better paced, and more viable. You will unlock far more useful weapons and skeletons later, but this addition serves as a good cushion for the early game. While honestly, I'd still recommend that you beeline through episodes 1 and 2 and head directly to episode 3 as soon as you can, 
the earlier introduction of a viable non-lethal weapon and exoskeleton does mean newcomers will generally have an easier and better time exploring the first two episodes that, in the original version of the game, were kind of a slog and really left you with very little progression in that first, you know, like 10 hours or so that you're spending in this first region. It is also during the early game that you unlock another new addition, the firing range. In it, you can pick up any weapons you have unlocked thus far and just do some casual target practice to get a feel for these weapons. And you can also take on the myriad timed drills that will have you eliminating targets in as short a time as possible. It's a time trial, essentially. New drills unlock as you unlock additional weapons with drills specifically designed around those weapons. The game also throws some ranked drills into the mix that has you competing with other players times and the higher you are in percentage in the leaderboards the more crafting materials you'll receive as a reward which is a really nice incentive. They remind me a lot of the target practice drills in Metal Gear Solid 5 The Phantom Pain or the VR training missions from Metal Gear Solid. Those who like to compete can look forward to a nice little side activity to focus on when not doing delivery runs or when you have done one delivery run too many and just want to mix things up a bit. The next enhancement and addition came in the form of fast travel that's unlocked in episode 3. There was fast travel in the original game, but before fast travel locations were presented in the form of a list, but now you can actually select icons on a map, which is far more useful. Another major addition you get to unlock during episode 3 is the racetrack. You'll gain access to it by delivering the required crafting materials to build it after you get an email telling you where to go, and it's a fairly basic time trial minigame, kind of like the target practice drills. Instead, you're racing around a track by yourself, and the goal is to complete each race in the shortest amount of time possible, and there are ranked aspects to this too, ranked races that the game continues updates itself with. Much like the firing range, this is just something else to do on the side when you're not delivering if you're so inclined. Fully optional. Now, as much as I'd like to say that this is among the more compelling additions to the game, unfortunately, driving has never been one of the stronger aspects of Death Stranding. It functions enough to fulfill the purpose of being navigational tools for faster deliveries, but vehicles can definitely feel janky when it comes to collision, and they don't feel all that great to handle, drive, and control. So to dedicate an entire minigame that focuses on the driving mechanics that are just so-so doesn't make for the most attractive of minigames. And it also doesn't help that there are only two tracks which are technically two different routes of the same one track. And the track itself is pretty generic, nothing much to it to really spice things up. And while completionists no doubt will appreciate just the fact that there is additional content, the subpar core driving mechanics of the game does diminish the fun factor of this edition. But ultimately, it functions well enough that it can be a nice distraction every once in a while. This is just not gonna, like, blow you away and keep you hooked. Or at least it didn't for me. Now, more compelling is the inclusion of new PCC structures that have been added to the game, namely the Cairo Bridge unlocked in Episode 3, as well as the Jump Ramp and the Cargo Catapult unlocked in Episode 5. The Cairo Bridge I found to be a really welcome addition. While it doesn't span as far as the big bridge and it is significantly narrower, and while it does deactivate during timefall when it rains, it is a great alternative to have for smaller gaps in the open world, and its smaller size also makes it easier to find a good spot to actually build it, whereas the large bridge requires a large even surface area on both sides of the bridge. The big bridges are still very much invaluable, but it is a good thought for Kojima Productions to introduce a smaller scale version of it with some drawbacks that are reasonable enough. As for the jump ramp, it's another style of bridge with a lot of flexibility in terms of where it can be built because you only need one side, but they are riskier. If placed poorly, it could actually screw over players who are trying to jump over a cliff and you still have to come at them with the right speed and angle, but if placed right and utilized well by players, it is a great way to overcome cliffs and gaps when navigating with the fast and flexible motorcycle. The drawback being that their use case is limited to just motorcycles, so they won't be of use during treks on foot or when you're driving larger and slower vehicles. Finally, we have the cargo catapult, which to me, this one ended up being one of the less useful structures. It allows you to load cargo onto it that can then be shot a certain amount of distance and that cargo will land and be kept safe until you reach the destination and pick it up. Now, it could very well be that I personally haven't discovered compelling use cases for it and others will, but in my experience, the catapult just doesn't shoot cargo far enough to 
be worthwhile. I just found it easier and more expedient to just build and use zip lines. Cargo catapults also cost a significant amount of chiral bandwidth, the resource that caps how many structures one player can build in a given region. 1100 for the cargo catapult by comparison. Two zipline anchors are a thousand, five hundred each. Not to say that strategic placement of catapults cannot come in handy. So, for example, if a catapult is placed high up on a mountain, that would allow you to shoot your cargo to the bottom, potentially, to mitigate risk of damaging it during a potentially dangerous downwards trek. But I've rarely felt compelled to build or use them, especially since they're unlocked right around the same time as the ziplines, which to me definitely feel far more useful. But again, maybe I'm just missing something and other players will find far more useful ways to make use of the catapult in ways that I didn't think of. So those are the major additions to placeable structures on top of everything that was in the original game. Now outside of PCC structures, a new tool in the director's cut is the Buddy Bot, also unlocked during episode 5. It's an AI companion who you can relieve some of your cargo burden to, and you can also have it automatically transport cargo or yourself even if you ride it to a destination. The buddy bot has three different modes. Follow mode, which speaks for itself. The bot will follow you around where you go or it'll try to. Standby mode sees the buddy bot head over to the nearest delivery facility. And finally, delivery mode sees the buddy bot deliver any cargo that's meant for a specific destination that's been loaded onto it in the order of how close that destination is. So if you have three cargo for three different destinations, it'll go to the closest destination first, then the second closest, and then the furthest one. The major drawback to the buddy bot that got in the way was its AI. They do a fine job of following you in less hazardous terrain, but presented with even a small challenge, be it traversing rocky terrain, crossing a ladder bridge, or even a big bridge, and it just doesn't seem to know what to do or how to follow you or how to take the most efficient route. Even when the terrain isn't all that hazardous, the AI's pathing can sometimes be very inefficient in the way it follows you. The AI was poor enough that I felt like I was always babysitting the buddy bot, making sure it was following me properly, which made it more of a liability that can slow down deliveries. It is kind of nice to be able to hop onto the bot and have it take you to the nearest facility automatically if you need to step away from the game for a bit but still make some progress, but the bot isn't particularly fast and its questionable AI just makes the process slower than it should be. Now the bot can be useful in transporting lost cargo and crafting materials you might want to send to a facility on the side without you personally having to physically go out of your way to do so, have this robot do it for you, but getting the bot to properly follow me limited my traversal enough and trying to navigate the world with the buddy bot is enough of a struggle that I didn't find using the buddy bot worth while ultimately. There's just better tools to fulfill the bot's purpose better. If you need help carrying a lot of cargo, the carriers will be much better at following you around even across rough terrain because they're quite literally tethered to you and not to mention that they can carry quite a bit and you can attach two of them in a row. For navigation, the bot's AI again just consistently slowed me down, so they're just better ways to get around your own two legs, vehicles, you name it. Buddy bots also cannot get into vehicles, so bringing a buddy bot while driving will mean having to wait for them quite a while for them to catch up if you just rush ahead. And once again, maybe other players will find better use cases, but for me, I feel like the full potential of their usefulness was not realized and they just need a bit of work. Moving past Episode 5, a new feature that unlocked during Episode 8 for me was customization of the BB Pod, cosmetic customization that is. You can apply various colors and patterns and schemes to it and, you know, it's nothing super major, but Pretty neat for those who do enjoy cosmetic customization. Now, two new things in the game that I didn't get to unlock and use are tools related to the backpack customization that allows for enhancements like extra grenade pouches and battery packs, as long as the limited space allows for it. In Director's Cut, they also added a new level for batteries, battery level three, that are smaller and last longer, and they added what's called a maneuver unit that you actually saw in the trailer. It's this jetpack-like device that allows for controlled landings from high places. These are unlocked by increasing the connection levels of various facilities and preppers, and even after 55 hours of gameplay, I was still not able to unlock them, though I wasn't going too far out of my way to max out connection 
connection levels at all of the facilities either. Both of these are definitely powerful tools that can make navigation, traversal, and deliveries significantly more convenient, so it does make sense that the game really makes you work for these. For those who do tackle a lot of side deliveries and go out of their way to do as much as possible as they go through the story, we'll probably unlock the maneuver unit before the campaign's over. I've got to say, in general, the new tools and structures are introduced in a well-paced manner throughout the game's campaign. I was afraid that some of the new content looked a bit too powerful and they would diminish the flow and progression of the game, but the new content is introduced at just the right time to smoothen out the progression, pacing, and flow without making the game too easy, all while granting just more options and flexibility in approaching deliveries for players with these new structures that give you new ideas for how to enhance the efficiency of your navigation. Even if some of these were more useful for me than others, they were all ultimately welcome additions nonetheless. None of them were a detriment to the game. A lot of these are definitely significant positives, and no doubt players will figure out a variety of clever use cases for much of the stuff that I haven't figured out. Last but not least, for new director's cut content, after finishing the main story, I finally unlocked that new mission that was teased in the director's cut trailer showing the interior of an abandoned factory. It's the same abandoned factory you go to in the early game to unlock the Mazer gun and the support skeleton, but you go deeper into the facility, into the more Metal Gear-like interior section seen in the trailer, and this section seems to be only accessible after you've beaten the game, after you've rolled credits on the main story. Now, I did think there were going to be an extensive amount of new missions that are like these, more Metal Gear-esque, but I found that I only had to visit the abandoned factory a grand total of three times to complete it, the first two times to unlock the Mazer Gun and the Support Skeleton, the third time after the main campaign to infiltrate the more heavily fortified segment. So it's just one abandoned factory with three missions that successively take you deeper into the factory. And there's some new story bits here and there, nothing hugely major, but some interesting revelations that add to the world building. It is definitely a shame that these missions were so short-lived, and you're definitely not gonna feel like Snake and Metal Gear as this game's stealth mechanics are nowhere near as in-depth as those of Metal Gear as this just isn't a stealth game and Sam Porter Bridges isn't some special agent, but it does evoke Metal Gear vibes, just the music, the way everything's laid out, and it was kind of a nice nudge and callback, but you're just better off having fun by going full Rambo. Stealth is definitely not Death Stranding strong suits. But yeah, I'd say the abandoned factory missions accounted for roughly an hour of my playtime. So not a lot, but new content regardless. And to close things off, one quality of life feature that's been added is the ability to replay the bosses that you fight in this game, a feature that was sorely missing in the original. And they've added just new little things like, for example, enemy encampments, the mules now have these mounted machine guns that they'll use against you and you can use against them. And just, there are little additions like that here and there as well. And that's pretty much all of the Director's Cut specific content. And with that, the question becomes, who is Death Stranding Director's Cut for? As I said at the beginning, if you've already ruled out Death Stranding as a game that is for you, then this is not gonna change your mind. This isn't some major overhaul. It is, at its core, the same game, just with a few neat additions. But if you've been itching to do another playthrough of Death Stranding, or if you're a newcomer who hasn't tried this game, have been curious about it, and want to play the best version of it, this is the version of the game you want. And for those who already own the PS4 version, there is an upgrade path, $10 from PS4 to PS5 Director's Cut. And combined with the ability to transfer your old save file, it'll at the very very least make it worth checking out for veterans. The core experience is definitely improved and you can feel how much more feature complete this uh, director's cut is. So based on my experience with the director's cut, I believe this is how the game breaks down in terms of who it's for. And I hope this video proved to be informative and allows you to make an informed purchase decision and allow you to decide whether upgrading to director's cut or purchasing Death Stranding for the first time through Director's Cut is for you. And that, ladies and gentlemen, is my review and overview of Death Stranding Director's Cut and all of its new content. If you enjoyed this video, I hope you'll consider supporting me on Patreon, hitting that join button and contributing directly that way. Or you can also purchase some merch like this shirt, the hat back there, this loot box shaped stress box 
that uh, makes fun of the EA surprise mechanics bullshit. But mainly, I'm grateful that you're here, enjoying my content, interacting with it, liking it, sharing it, viewing it. It all means a lot. And uh, look forward to more reviews down the line, more news and gaming-related content. And with that, I will see you guys next time. Young out.